Cynthia Endo, welcome to the Austrian Institute for International Affairs, the OIIP. We're glad to have you. My first time. <laughs> welcome. Um, tonight's talk is about the links between militarization and patriarchy. Um, what would you say, um, how do they sustain each other? Well, I think I, I keep reminding myself I spend a lot of time not thinking about patriarchy in order to think about military politics, militaries, militaries, and racism. So I really always look back and think, well, what did I miss, right? And I miss a whole level of the workings of power, but I also missed resistance. So I think now it would be very hard for me to talk. I don't, I think I'm now kind of unable to talk about militarism and militaries without talking about patriarchy, but I spent a long time not doing it. So I kind of remember what I was like when I was dumb. <laughs> so what does it add to, to think about patriarchy in that context? Well, I think one of the first things that jumped out at me when I first started is how many state elites, state decision makers at all levels, they worry about women all the time. Right? And I, all those years when I wasn't paying attention, that means I missed, missed their worries. And I'm very interested in what people eat with some kind of authority and power. I'm very interested in what they worry about. I love to know about people's anxieties, and especially about people who have power and what they're anxious about. Um, the other thing is that I missed how difficult it is for many women, very diverse women in many countries, to figure out what their own relationships are to soldiers, to ideas of militarism, to ideas of patriotism, that it's not obvious how diverse women make those calculations and then act on them. And I missed all of that. Mm -hmm. I missed a lot. So your work always looks at these issues globally, never US-centric, never Western-focused, <laughs> um, but to really lay out how, in a globalized world, yeah. of course, these are global challenges. Uh, in Western Europe, particularly in Austria, we're not usually very concerned about militarism and militarization. We have a very small scale mm -hmm. military. We have an anti-militarist consensus after World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess you would caution us to still uh, keep in mind that these processes are ongoing. So where should we look to? What should we focus on to understand these challenges? That's interesting, yeah. Um, I've learned especially from Costa Rican feminists, because Costa Rica has no military at all, and Icelandic feminists, because Iceland has no military at all. And I remember recently I was in Iceland, an Icelandic feminist. I mean, I, I try, I've been there enough to not wax romantic about Iceland, but it's, for people from Austria and the US, it's very easy to wax romantic about Icelandic uh, society. But they would say, they point to me the one gray Coast Guard boat out in the harbor. And they'd say, look out, look out, look out. We are part of NATO. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a military. You never see soldiers anywhere. Well, they don't exist, but you don't see armed police anywhere. But they say, you know, militarism works by back channels. And it works through fear mongering. And you have to watch that as well, not just the most overt tanks rolling down the street mm -hmm. for the patriotic parade. Don't, don't think that if there are no patriotic parades with artillery and tanks rolling down, you don't have a problem with uh, militarism, because it creeps. Mm -hmm. And we certainly have a, a drift towards mm -hmm. the right in Europe, and we have uh, huge challenges in the European Union to define what Europe is, what yeah. it stands for. Right. Uh, and this is very often linked to anti-feminism, mm. anti-equality movements. So um, from your experience and from everything you observe from all over the world, what can we do now? Listen to feminists. I mean, really, no, it's, it's, I, I've learned a lot. If I want to make sense of the Philippines now, I listen to Filipino feminists. And I try to listen to Korea. I've tried to listen to feminists in a lot of places um, because they're my teachers, you know. I don't know things and then I go to the Philippines. It's the Filipino feminists who teach me things. And I think one of the things that 
feminists have taught each other, oftentimes because they compare notes. You know, this Beijing um, uh, was really important in that, the 1995 UN meeting. It was the first time that um, Filipino feminists compared notes with Korean feminists and together compared notes with um, Singaporean and other South Pacific feminists. And they, one of the things that they've said is, listen, listen, listen. Listen to what, how women define their own anxieties and to what extent those anxieties are informed by xenophobia. Um, even if they don't sound as though they're proposing a larger defense budget, right? Who is the them, capital T? And has it changed? Is it a different them than their mothers used to talk about? Right? And that's, that's, I think, what I've really learned from listening to feminists in different countries. So create alliances? Um, create alliances and listen. You know, listen a lot. Listen to people that aren't reported on, you know, in Le Monde, um, who aren't reported on by Reuters, uh, which means nowadays we've got to find other ways to listen to feminist activists and feminist thinkers in a lot of different parts of the world, which oftentimes means you have to join, you know, international alliances at least to get the newsletters. You asked this fundamental question, it's a very simple question, seemingly simple, where are the women? Um, beginning in the 1980s uh, with your um, Bananas, Beaches and Bases book. The answer to this question is very different today, right? You can see women in a lot of high profile positions, but would you say that asking the question, the relevance of the question and the answers to it have really fundamentally changed? Well, I never thought that women were homogeneous. So when I ask where the women are in the foreign ministry, I don't just look at Margot Wallstrom, right, um, who now has resigned that post, um, which is itself a big story. Um, I also ask, well, where are women in the foreign service? Where are women on which committees in the Swedish parliament? Are they on the foreign affairs committees? If so, do they have any kind of voice? Um, so I think the where are the women question is so complicated. And it, you know, it takes a village at least, a whole alliance of villages to answer that question. So I think it is true, I think you're absolutely right, Saskia, that nowadays it may look as though you can look at Angela Merkel and that's the answer to the question, but of course it isn't. Either is Nancy Pelosi, you know. Um, uh, but they matter, I mean, they do matter, and it does matter whether any one of those women who are now prominent in their own political systems, will they be succeeded by another woman? Or will people be fooled into thinking, well, we've done it. See, we've broken that glass ceiling and now we don't have to do it anymore. Which, of course, is the way patriarchy works. You know, you resist, you resist, you resist. You give in a little bit and then you go back to the way you always like to do it. And then people don't notice. But that brings me to one last question, also because you brought it up uh, with Margaret Wallstrom. Mm. Uh, what's your take on feminist foreign policy? Is that a sustainable way to challenge? Well, the way Wallstrom herself described it, and the way a lot of now there are several networks, there are a couple of um, podcasts on feminist foreign policy, a couple of YouTube channels, I think. Um, it's very interesting. So she set off a whole uh, multi-stranded discussion, so we don't have to just rely on Wallstrom herself, and Wallstrom was really affected by Kavina till Kavina, till, till Kavina mm -hmm. with K, K, mm -hmm. which means women in Swedish. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, she didn't dream up feminist foreign policy. It came out of WILF, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Sweden, and it came out of Kavina till Kavina. I mean, there was, there are sources there, and she listened to them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's striking to me about the way when she does and she always gives full credit, she never says, I created this, um, is that she talks about international development, about human rights, and um, about foreign policy in its formal sense. So she always was looking at a whole host of the ways that states interact in the world, um, not just 
uh, your defense policy, mm -hmm. or not just your formal diplomatic policy, but also international development and human rights. And those are her three kind of pillars for her notion. And that means we, we need all of us. You know, just think of how many people are informing us about the way patriarchy is persists in international development, right? And the way patriarchy persists in the shrinking of human rights, and the way that patriarchy is just pushed aside in most governments' foreign policy until it serves a particular government's short-term needs. So lots still to do. Thank goodness. <laughs> Wouldn't it be just terrible if we said, well, we'd wrap that up? Yeah. <laughs> That'd be just depressing. We look forward to tonight's talk. Thank you very much. Thank you.